Hello, everyone, and welcome to the first event in our new series, Your Path to Farm Transition. I'm Roland McFadden, and I'm an FCC Senior Relationship Manager out of Calgary, Alberta. I'm excited to be your host today. A little background on myself. I'm born on a mixed uh, farming operation, born and raised just an hour south of the city. Uh, mixed, mixed grain and beef cattle operation. So I've lived this and been a part of it my whole life. So I'm excited to talk about this important topic with you today. Today is also part of a, is part of a nine part series we have created to walk you and your family, your technical advisors and your farm team through the transition process. These events are being held monthly and each follow a step in creating your plan. We will be joined by FCC business advisors, other experts and farmers just like you. Now, let me introduce our speakers. We're thrilled to have Anessa and Joel with us today. They're both business advisors with FCC. They're experienced farm transition facilitators. They not only initiate and lead the conversation to help producers and families make the best strategic decisions for their operations. So now, please join me in welcoming Anessa and Joel. Awesome, appreciate it. Thank you so much, Roland. Truly appreciate uh, uh, the kind words there to get us started. We are so excited to kick off this series. Uh, the first of nine, uh, truly, truly excited to see where this goes um, uh, over out the, throughout the whole year. And it's really there to help guide you and develop your plan so that you as a family can meet, regularly discuss each one after, uh, after you get back at it. And so we're gonna kick off today. We're gonna talk about this first topic here, prepare and identify. Uh, some of the issues that are in your transition plan. We've got a whole host of issues that, uh, that do come up when we start to talk about this. And we're gonna talk a little bit about those and spend some time kind of scoping that whole plan and then talking about what we can do to get organized and prepared to help set us on a proper path forward. I do wanna point out the whole list there. It will be in your chat as well. Uh, and definitely look for that, uh, that event link in the bottom that's gonna to link to all those sessions and hopefully you're registered for all of them. Uh, and special mention just for our August 9th event, we have two fantastic advisors, uh, uh, Andrew DeGroote and Corey Henderson. They're going to lead us through that one. And our whole team of national business advisors is going to work together on these topics to share and moderate them. So please look for those. And uh, I think Ines is going to share a little bit of a story around, uh, around what's so important about planning through this. Yeah, thank you, Joel. And so definitely, uh, you know, very excited that FCC has decided to focus on a nine-step series and it was very intentional because you will hear all the time, and it is true, transition is a process, not an event. And so to truly emulate that, we have identified these nine steps to help walk your family through your transition plan, uh, regardless of the age and or stage you're at in the transition. Because as we know, there's gonna be a wide breadth across Canada of where you're at, but I truly do believe there's little nuggets in all nine steps because transition is continually uh, going back, reviewing, assessing, and are we where we need to be? And so definitely uh, these steps build upon each other. And something that Joel and I uh, very much recognize as both being the junior generations on our own family farms is that these steps to transition can be tricky at times. We're working with family, we're working with business, legacy, we're gonna get into that today. And so something Joel and I are very um, encouraging of is to hear from farmers themselves. And so a family I recently worked with, um, I asked for them to speak with us today because they are truly at this prepare and identify stage. They're starting to lean on third party help whether it's a business advisor, your accountant, your lawyer, having a third neutral party to help facilitate some of these important questions and get the conversation started is key. So please enjoy hearing from the family in this video. Hi, I'm Rod Dick. I'm Adam Dick. I'm Joanne, Rod's wife. I'm Sam Dick. And I'm Keisha, Sam's wife. You know, we have a farm called Critters and Crops Limited. It's been in the farm for three generations, established in 1930. So it's quite sentimental to us. One thing I liked about working with Anessa, uh, when we, I think I know everything about what everyone thinks about farming and what they're gonna do in the future, but some of her questions made us really think. 
As an off-farm child, I've always felt that Anessa really understood my needs and concerns. She did a great job of making me feel included in the entire process. For me, it was not that we just need to communicate, but that we also need to make sure things are written down so we all understand what we are trying to talk about and get through. I really appreciated how she uh, clarified a few difficult uh, questions and uh, encouraged us to talk about all different aspects of the farm succession and she did a great job. Thank you very much. And so certainly the key takeaway again is working with third party advisors to help your family through your transition journey. And so while we got to meet that family today, we're now going to move over to our Joel poll number one. Joel, do you want to tell us what this is about? Joel poll, that's pretty cute. So I think it's something that uh, you definitely want to work through. So it's understanding who's out there, right? We just saw a family that had multiple generations involved. Each of them are going to have their own perspectives. And we'd love to get to know who's out there that we're speaking with and we can kind of adapt a little bit. So if you look to that chat box on the right uh, of your screen, the poll is going to pop up and we just really want to get a good sense of what generation are we speaking with today? Are you the senior generation? Are you the sandwich generation where you're still transitioning from this senior generation, but you also have a next generation wondering about their spot in the business? Are you the junior generation or are you multiple generations watching this together uh, to go through this series? So, if you can fill that chat box out, I think something that always stands out to me here is that each of us, as we uh, go through different ages, we're going to have different priorities and things that are going to come up and it's going to affect us differently. And so working with each generation is going to kind of define their values, their success over time and what it could look like. What comes to mind for you, Anessa? Yeah, I think certainly understanding um, the different perceptions and as you alluded to, Joel, what is important to you at that stage. And so certainly what we're really focusing on throughout this entire nine series is being proactive rather than reactive. And there's power in that because it truly takes away the feeling of being personal because that's how it feels if we're reacting to something, right? It's a personal against me, my generation, where I'm at in our family transition plan. So we're excited to hear uh, from Roland here today who the audience is that we're speaking to today and we'll tailor our presentation uh, a little bit to that. Survey says. So yeah, we got a couple, the slowly results are coming in. Um, so, okay, I think we got her all wrapped up. We got a split, all of us a split for the top. It looks like we have 33% of the senior generation joining us today, 20% uh, of the sandwich generation, 34% the junior generation, and 9% of multi-generations walking together. So we got a good mix here today. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah awesome, appreciate that, thank you. So lots to kind of unpack there, right? So we're multiple stages coming at this. Uh, each of us is gonna have our own interpretation of what we need to know for a plan going forward. And let's maybe dive into a little bit of what that could look like. So this slide is meant to be busy as it pops up on the screen here. There's a lot that we're trying to work through and think through. Uh, we start these farm transition plans with a senior generation and a junior generation. We go into things, generally tends to start, we're going into it, we just start doing the things we've always done on the farm and haven't really talked about the process or what it could look like for us as a family. And so all these things start to blend together that come up as common issues that we start to experience as families and business to some degree. Um, families will experience them differently. Some will be, certain issues will pop up more than others, but almost every family does experience some of these uh, at some point. So some of the common family transition ones are, we haven't built a shared process for how we're gonna communicate. Uh, we've got different visions and values that we're gonna try to communicate with each other. Uh, we have different participation families. Do certain spouses get to participate in conversations and other ones not? Uh, have we dealt with how we would deal with conflict in some of these plans and, and, and address that as a family? Some of the business ones, have we talked about, uh, right, what it means for compensation over time? Have we talked about job performance and expectations around those pieces, different work-life balances so that we can put those on the table and start to build a long-term plan? And then when we get to ownership, have we started to talk about, do we have good structures in place, good agreements? Uh, have we talked about uh, how we would transition ownership at some point? Are we looking to keep building that business or, or kind of harvest some pieces for those uh, retirement income or, or letting go of ownership? So lots of things come up for you as a family. And sometimes when we lump it all together, try to have transition conversations about everything all at once, it can feel pretty jumbled. And so 
separating them out and starting to say, are we having a family conversation, a business or an ownership one can really add a lot of value. And in agriculture, as you see on the bottom, a lot of other issues can compound in this too. So we have a lot of assets that have built in value relative to productive capability, things influence. A lot of farms are trying to expand in a similar spot that expanding with what we have to try to grow bigger and kind of maintain our current size. And with that, a lot of our senior generation's wealth is kind of tied up in the business. And so there's a tremendous amount there to unpack. And we won't get too much into the unpacking today. We want to talk about how we're going to prepare to address these uh, long term. So with that, I think something that we both agree is, uh, you know, is a tool used by NASA and is one of the habits of uh, Stephen Covey's highly effective people uh, is really starting to think about the end in mind. And so this is how I think start most of my family conversations is really starting to think about if things just started to happen, what would our family look like in this process, uh, right? That doesn't mean we have to always hold hands and run through the daffodils together or something like that, right? But can we talk about how we're gonna maintain healthy respect with each other, how we wanna look and operate as a family through this process? Can we talk about what our business looks like? All right, do we wanna be in business together? What would make being in business together even better? And what does uh, ownership start to look like as well? So have we, under have we communicated our expectations for what it means to be an owner? What, uh, when ownership would, uh, when we start to transfer in, would we maybe take less uh, income from the farm to receive ownership and participate in that equity growth and things like that come up all the, t all the time and just expressing it can help you envision where you're going as a family and give you that real anchor point uh, that you're gonna use to start to work through some of those issues and build a process for yourself. So thinking with the end in mind is a great step. And then we can start to talk about some of the some of the things. So I think as Anessa and I were doing this, it kind of came up, some of those buzzwords started popping up and we wanted to tackle those. And so I know Anessa maybe jumping into the first one here with, uh, with B, birthright here. Yeah, for sure. And so something that Joel and I are very cognizant of, of working with uh, the families that we've been honored to do so is that um, there's this sense of overwhelmed. So they come to us and say, there's so many resources, articles, videos available to us today. Um, we don't know where to start. And so that's certainly what today is about, is what are those key documents we can get together as a family, as a business at home, and identify our key stakeholders. But in that, what Joel and I see time and time again is families get stuck thinking about these issues um, and concerns and kind of these buzzwords that we hear a lot when we start to enter into the transition process. So Joel and I did intentionally want to highlight a few of them. And then in the latter part of this presentation, we will walk you through step-by-step -step action, key takeaways of where to start and what documents to get in place. But if we don't kind of highlight what can we potentially run into, it doesn't show the importance of why some of the administrative tasks and things like that that we're gonna talk about today are critically so important. So as Joel alluded to under uh, our B for birthright, um, a huge part of getting into the transition shift is shifting your mindset. And so what does that mean? Every single farm is in transition every single day. And so control comes up a lot in our family discussions. And something I really encourage families uh, to think about is shifting that mindset to protect. How do you emotionally feel if we change the conversation from one of control to protect? So all families I work with, it really comes down to a core of we're trying to protect our children, our farming children and our off-farm children, ourselves as the senior generation, and we're trying to protect our land, our key assets, and our legacy and our lifestyle. And the conversation changes when we shift our mindset simply from control to protect. Another uh, often heated conversation is off-farm children versus farming children. And this one again ties back to our proactive versus reactive conversation is, have we as a family set expectations or discussions of what those definitions mean? Uh, simply as Joel alluded to earlier, fair market value versus productive value, those are very different terms. Off-farm child versus farming child, what does that mean? Uh, have we set timelines? Um, and, you know, really, again, turning this into potentially an opportunity. I was working with a family, um, I've had a couple in COVID that their children chose to leave urban centers and move back to the farm in their 30s and 40s. 
and there had been no discussion prior if that door was always open but changing the lens to say if the business can support this which will be part of our discussion today getting our financial documents in order um, is that just an opportunity now for off-farm income, diversifying, new energy, all of these things. And so truly another element of that, Joel, is I to we. Do you want to talk about that a little bit? Yeah, so we, we call this I to we because this comes up. You're going to hear it's a process a lot in farm transition. Uh, one of the number one buzzwords, but honestly, it is a best practice that we see families commit to a consistent process. Uh, so often we get stuck in looking things, looking at things from our own individual perspective. I think when we meet, when Ness and I both meet with families, we see them looking at things from that perspective. And then pretty quickly when we ask how the senior generation or the junior generation would feel about that, that mindset starts to shift uh, uh, without, uh, with giving them kind of the space to actually communicate that. So looking at it and shifting from uh, what my value structure is, what I'm looking to get accomplished in this plan to what are we as a whole family looking to get accomplished and what can it look like? can add a lot of value and that brings up the element what do we need to do to maintain that I think maintaining a healthy process for how we're going to do that comes up a time and time again as best practice for family that they committed to a regular process for how they're going to do this and what it really comes down to is establishing and continuing to build trust within the family that we're not going off alone and using their own information to make up our own stories and and things in our own mind that we've set a scheduled time that we're going to meet focus on our transition goals that we want to get accomplished and keep maintaining and building that trust that we all are working towards that same end state that we talked about. And then they can bring this and be prepared to work with their team of advisors that uh, can help guide your farm plan. So all your advisors are gonna be looking at things from their perspective, their experiences, and they're to help kind of guide your decision-making in that process as part of that, uh, that whole team. And then it can definitely help you bridge that gap and bring all generations together Although it might not happen all at once, every process is going to look different. It can really help you do that, but uh, absolutely gets gets noisy at times, Anessa. I know you can kind of speak to that one. Yeah, for sure. And so, again, the reason um, we are taking some time to walk through these is because this is what families come into our meetings and say, we're stuck on fair versus equal, right? Probably one of the most heated, um, again, conversations or most common, complex decisions to come up with. And... Again, in talking about that, what we find as advisors is we have to come back to the basics and say, okay, before we can start talking about gifting equity or transferring at less than fair market value, um, you know, do we have guaranteed that mom and dad's retirement income is secure? Uh, do we comfortable with what your compensation will look like for all generations if you're one of that sandwich generation as well? Um, have we been clear on clarity of what this will look like now and in the future and once the will is read and that potential estate division? So I'm jumping in a little bit, Joel, uh, to your G's and O's, but we really wanted to get across that these are the buzzwords and the difficult elements that your family will need to face for sure, but to help support us and take some of that weight off your shoulders we're going to talk about this checklist to assess where we're at today. And there's extreme power in that. Uh, we intentionally put tax and the law as the middle square. So everyone gets to daub that with their bingo dauber um, because every family and business does need uh, a qualified tax and legal representative that can help assist them through this complex process and ensure um, that we're being as proactive from that side of the planning as well as family goals, visions, um, and things like that. And of course, communication. We all hear we need to communicate more and we need to communicate better. And I'll be the first one to put up my hand and say my family and I are still working through this one daily as well. But I think coming back to, as Joel alluded to, having intentional communication on intentional transition meetings to discuss some of these conversations and we'll talk about that more of creating expectations of how and when you work through the checklist and something that really stands out with me about communication um, is a quote I heard recently is comprehension is nothing sorry communication is nothing without comprehension so are we taking the time to really ask each other um, do you understand what I'm saying? Did you hear my intention correctly? And being very empowered to have those conversations with your technical advisors as well. 
We'll talk about them a little later in the presentation. They are on your team to support your business and your family, and you need to have that trust and comfortable um, to work with them as well. So Joel, do you want to explain to us a little bit about our G&O? Yeah, I have to ask first though, do you put tax and law in the middle? Because that's the number one goal, I'm not paying any tax. That, uh, so everyone yeah. wants that one free. Yeah, and that's our number one goal as advisors <laughs> is making sure you are working um, with to pay some tax to win in the end for sure. And so absolutely what uh, comes up here is goals again, right? It's something that uh, it's, it's typically where everybody starts, what are our goals? And so how do we pull that out uh, and start to make it tangible, right? Oftentimes there's simple things that we're just looking on on a timeline on a, how do we join ownership that, uh, right, I'd like to be a piece uh, piece of this and kind of establishing that vision and pulling them out. Uh, and oftentimes, as Anessa alluded to, uh, right, I think uh, when the senior generation's at a place, they're kind of worried about, right, they want to protect the farm and make sure that their hard work and, and sacrifice that have gone into things, they're looking from that perspective to make sure it's protected and uh, uh, and that they've got kind of their own secure income source going forward. And so when we talk about goals, it's really starting to get to a place that we're putting them on the table uh, and then moving into that process that we're going to get certainty and clarity long term. So that I think the number one thing that seems to bounce around people uh, is they don't have certainty or clarity about what their plan is going to look like. Um, and honestly, as they start to, and they won't, you won't at the beginning, but as you start to work through a process, uh, start to shift to that I to we, you'll be on a bit of more of a path to start to communicate. Uh, this is what our expectations are. This is how we get long-term ownership work into things uh, um, and, uh, and ultimately get to that place where you've got some clarity on the business and those goals line up with the opportunity that's there. And so in that opportunity, then you've got, okay, are we sure that the plan is feasible to work towards we want to get to financially and that uh, we're not overwhelmed in this process? We don't have to get this all accomplished at once. It's something we can build that opportunity out uh, over time. So won't spend a lot more time there. The purpose of our checklist is to help you with that communication one as well to enable you to kind of work through that. And that's where we want to spend most of it. But, uh, oh man, we got another uh, Joel poll here. So really kind of want to take a good look at this. Um, again, if you can revisit it back on the side, what are the steps you and your family have taken so far to uh, prepare your transition process already? So we're all at different stages, but are you having regularly, regularly establishing meetings to, uh, to discuss these issues? Have you talked to your technical advisors yet? Um, to set up your business structure, future plans? Do you have an up-to-date will? Are you budgeting living expenses? Are you using your financials to make decisions? And then is the junior generation participating in some of those business discussions uh, early on? So let us know what's popping up for you uh, out there. And uh, I think these are all things we're at different stages out um, or we experience differently and we go through different processes and need at different times. But Anessa, what comes to mind for you as we talk about this one here? Yeah, and so again, we hope with this uh, poll question, it's just kind of an internal check of where is our family at to date? So um, something I also notice a lot with families that come in is they don't grant themselves enough grace for how much work they've done already. So they'll come in and say, the articles say we're supposed to have all these meetings and we don't have them and we know slap us on the wrist. And I'm like, you just told me you meet every morning for coffee um, or you know once a week get together and text the night before about what the plan is. So find out the communication strategies that work for you. Um, and something else I always share with families, uh, it's a quote from Maggie Van Kemp, an associate in the industry. Uh, I love her quote, pace and grace. So pace, as Joel alluded to, this is not a event where we check everything off at once and we've done our transition plan. Uh, we truly are building a process to work with our advisors, continue to come back and assess where we're at. Um, but with that, we can't get lackadaisical. We still need to have this intention of these planned meetings and things like that. And grace, that's a big one. A lot of families we work with, the senior generation, their transition plan down to them did not involve these complex uh, corporate structures or the values of land and the complexities that Joel spoke about earlier that agriculture is compounded by. And so granting yourselves grace that we are all on this journey together, granting your family grace, yourself grace, and the opportunities that come with that. So what do we got, Roland? Yes. The results are in. I know everyone's eagerly anticipating at home. I was just trying to see how long I could get Anessa to talk for before I step back up here. 
Um, so yeah, we have quite a group joining us today. I'll just do it in numbers instead of percentages this time. So very interesting results. Um, six of the people watching have regular meetings. 25 have talked to technical advisors. 28 have an up-to-date will. Six budget for today and the future as well, which is a big one. Uh, four uh, make decisions using financial statements. And 25... Well, they are percentages I'm seeing now. 25% our junior uh, generation participates in the decision. So pretty good spread there. I mean, there's a lot of topics and also, um, you know, a lot of people might do them all. So mm. that's an important important part too. You can click more than one. And if you haven't haven't made it on some of them, it's never too late to start. And I, I do, I just thought of a new name for this poll. I want to start calling it the Roly Polies. So uh, you might be hooked onto that for future FCC events, but... Uh, something that, right, it's not things that we have to tackle all at once, but we're building a process, we're starting to work with them, and we're going to select the tools that are going to work for the issues uh, our family wants to work through, right? And so with that, the focal point of this, we do want to reference that checklist. You can find it uh, in the chat and then uh, also online. It will be attached in the email for this, but uh, we've got that taking stock checklist. It's going to help us get prepared and identify what we want to communicate about and really prepare ourselves to go through this process. Uh, Anessa, do you want to maybe lead us through number one here that we have on the checklist? Yeah, for sure. So now that we've talked about why working through this checklist is so important, let's dig into the meat and potatoes of it. So number one, assessing your family and business picture. So this is very important as for both internal for your family and the key stakeholders involved and external as well for uh, sharing with your technical advisors. And so, Joel, if you go to the next slide here, you'll see some examples we have. So when I work with families, the first thing we start with is a good old fashioned family tree. I promise you the steps we're asking you to complete are not that scary. And so the family tree is very powerful because it is a snapshot of where your family is at today. Like we talked about, transition plans are always needing to be reassessed because we are going to change in the ages and stages. What the family tree does is it shows as technical advisors, there's lots we can pull from that and the family can as well. So for example, what's the relationship status of everyone involved? Is there any risk management uh, tools or discussions we need to have in place? Um, residence location. So for example, if any of your potential heirs live outside of Canada, um, does that need to come up with a discussion of what the potential tax implications of that could be? And then stripping it down to the family level, um, you know, where does everyone want to live? Are we creating rural lifestyle for acreages? Um, do we need to budget for the business an upcoming capital expense to build a new house for, you know, the senior generation or the junior generation? There's a lot we can pull from within that family tree. And so once again, key step, get yourself organized when we start these documents. Um, create a file, either online or printed version, and create duplicates to share with your advisors as well as your family. And Joel, would you like to dig in a little bit to the three circle model we have here? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, we referenced all those common transition issues that pop up time and time again. And often what we find is families start to communicate uh, about the whole farm all at once. And so we're starting to have uh, business meetings when we're trying to discuss ownership and things like that, it's so tempting to start talking about what the cows are doing or, oh, if only grain markets would do this, we'd get, uh, our plan would be so simple or if we had certainty on that side and we constantly kind of get pulled back into business discussions, partially as a way to avoid difficult conversations, but uh, can help if you start to segregate out your family discussions, your business discussions and those ownership discussions as well. So as a family, what do we want to get accomplished? How do we want to be organized and communicate uh, and sometimes identifying who's even going to be involved in those family discussions. Are spouses included? Uh, does the, you know, the resident, the uh, U.S. resident uh, that Anessa mentioned um, living in California, do they need to be part of everything? Um, who's involved in our business issues, right? Again, is that off-farm child constantly kind of maybe getting trapped when they want to know about, right? They might like to own a piece of land and have that rented back to the farm at some point, but they're constantly pulled into a a business discussion, do they need to be part of those ones? And so separating them out and starting to pencil out what are the conversations we wanna have in our family, in the business, and the ownership side of things uh, can really help you make progress. And then setting an agenda for how we're gonna do that. So you've got it kind of anchored in 
this is what we're going to focus on and this is what we're going to do if we start to stray uh, from those conversations. And I know one way you talk about uh, ownership is the other chart here. Uh, if you can look on the bottom right of your screen, Anessa, maybe explain that one for us. Yeah, for sure. And so definitely, again, I just find the power of writing things down, the visual representation. And so even as alluded to in the video, right, that was one of the exercises the family found very helpful. So within your checklist, there's different templates um, for you to fill out. And that's what I really encourage um, to have your other family members fill out the three circle model as well. And what's their perception of what the future looks like? And is there any surprises? And again, we're just sparking um, open and honest conversations. And so the diagram on the bottom, um, you know, can be looked at as a ownership tool, but more I look at it from a business tool for transition. Um, your farm doesn't have to have multiple corporations um, to draw this out, but having a clear picture of where are your different profit centers. So for example, um, you know, if senior generation has a profit center, whether they're incorporated or not, and junior generation does as well, the power that comes from that is we can start to say, okay, is senior generation subsidizing junior generation? Very common in today's agriculture economics, but what are the expectations? Is it being tracked? What is the conversation um, around that? And what's also an uh, important tool is have you financially supported your off-farm children um, to date and is that being tracked and recorded and starting to have those discussions for expectations as well. So that's a great place to start with the family. Joel, let's jump to the farm asset catalog. All right, so something that becomes incredibly important as Anessa mentioned, as you start to pull things out, um, building that farm asset uh, list can become hugely important. And so if you look on in uh, checklist number two there, there's some great articles on how to do that, what to pull out. But I think what always comes to mind is, again, we're lumping everything together and trying to come up with one plan for everything all at once. But sometimes how I like to start is let's focus on just the business piece. So what does our equipment look like? What does our inventory look like? What are the operating debt and pieces of that business that function day to day uh, that are going to become important for us to address as a family? And so in that, there's conversations around job performance and uh, how you eventually get to make decisions in that business. Uh, and then we can separate out what ownership can look like as well. We have a lot of uh, large, uh, heavy asset valued items, and we can list those out and start to say, okay, well, we need to make sure we've got a plan for this as well in terms of our land, our buildings, our quota, things like that that can be listed out that have large values. And then also our personal uh, side of things. And then Nessa will chat about net worth in a sec here, but have we listed out some of those personal things that might be options? Uh, RRSPs, TSFAs, dad's gigantic scrap pile that uh, right is huge in value. And so you can list those things out and start to say, okay, let's craft a plan maybe around the business first, how the next gen starts to come into the business, makes decisions uh, and understands that relationship. And, uh, and then as we progress, can talk about ownership and non-farm children kind of with off-farm assets and, uh, uh, and uh, right, what their piece in ownership and things like that mean long-term too. And so great way to just start listing it out and really enable you to have better conversations with your advisors as well. Um, and a big part of that is kind of evaluating that net worth too, Anessa. Yeah, certainly. And so, you know, again, we're reiterating this sounds common sense to be able to list out who owns what, um, you know, within the business or personally, but it truly is an exercise that takes time and is very powerful to share and or discuss with your transition advisors. So on the net worth side, like Joel spoke to already, what do you own personally? So your personal real estate, um, your investments, life insurance is often a common one. Um, and then RSPs, like you mentioned. But what also is really important with your personal is what debt do you have personally, meaning personal credit cards, personal uh, line of credit. And this is very powerful to also start to calculate and take um, account for, because I've seen many families where this is a very contentious issue, where mom and dad have personally supported the farm business. And now the discussion of is, whose debt is that to take on? And are we being clear and upfront with the upcoming generation, which truly ties into uh, our farm financials, which will be uh, series two here. But Joel, what about number four? Probably one of the most important ones. Yeah. And so absolutely, as we're um, looking at this, reviewing a will and an estate plan as part of this process. So checking in and seeing where we're at, 
Uh, so often these things maybe aren't in place, even when we're starting and we think, well, we're just starting. What do we need to have in place? Um, can be such a, such a big thing that I think the number of families we've met with that uh, had life-altering kind of events that if they'd had something early uh, and listed out kind of their intention, really would have helped their family kind of plan through a transition uh, long-term. And it gives you a really think, big thinking exercise, I find, with families to start to sit down and say, okay, if something happened, what would we want to see with that uh, proverbial end in mind, I guess? And uh, how do you start to break that out uh, in a will so that our intentions will be met? And so, as Anessa mentioned earlier, comprehension is important as part of that. Uh, ideally, these things, I think, best practice, again, are communicated ahead of time so people have some certainty, but we recognize things might change as part of our transition process. It's going to be something we'll continue to revisit as we move through a plan. Uh, but something I do recommend is that you start to pull out, uh, I see it work really well with families, that you start to write a letter with that too as to why you did things the way you did so that those intentions are listed out there and everybody gets a common understanding of what your goals were through this process. And then you start to list out the people that you want involved, powers of attorney, executors, and things like that. Are there some things that come to mind for you, Anessa, when we talk about wills? So certainly, um, you know, this is a big one regarding the age and stage of where your family is at in your own transition journey. But something I hear a lot from uh, the senior generation is they are um, cautious to put anything in writing because they don't know yet what the future is going to look like, especially in those early uh, years of the transition plan. And so something we really encourage is treating your will as an emergency will or a holiday will, um, something you are comfortable with for the next three years. In three years time, we can reevaluate, reassess. Um, potentially there's been changes of equity or ownership, but I just really find um, when people realize it's just planning for the next three years, they're much more willing to engage and actually put something down in writing. And again, on your checklist, uh, there's some great templates and tools to work through to support your family. And just as critical, junior generation has a will as well um, for farming and off farm. All right, so number five, um, very, very, very important step that again, seems common sense that we often see overlooked. And it is truly intentional for FCC's language that we say a living budget um, because it is what lifestyle do you want to live? And so we intentionally don't call it retirement income, uh, for example. And so uh, on the checklist, you'll see a template and I encourage you to fill it out in two ways. Number one, what does it cost to live today and taking into account what are the perks we're getting on the farm such as um, you know no rent utilities vehicles gas and this is a great tool for junior generation to have recognition and appreciation for as well and then secondly that forecasted budget for the future of what would we need if we ever needed to move to town for a health complication for example um, and really assessing what it costs to live when you don't have all those perks supporting you just as critical again for your advisor. Um, I have lots of families come to me and say, we need this many thousand dollars a year, hard stop. Um, please get your budgets uh, vetted by a financial planner, for example, that will take into account um, appreciation, things like that. And this is where you can get creative working with your accountant in time of what kind of sources of income will you get from a tax planning perspective. So, okay, Joel, number six. Yeah. And I do want to just touch on that one too. I mean, it's so important to just kind of think through uh, yeah, where those sources are. Do we know, is it coming from a share redemption? Is it coming from land rent? Uh, those kind of things, because they're going to have big impacts on the, fam on the family business as we go forward. And so some great resources there. There is a cost of living calculator that can help you identify some steps and a, and a great article too, uh, 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 outlaid by our, our colleague Audrey and Corey as well. So check those ones out in that checklist to kind of provide a little more info. Um, but why it becomes so important is that it feeds into our farm financial plan. And so doing this farm financial health checkup from the beginning gives you that uh, number to kind of start working with that. Uh, how are we going to do this as a family? We're going to have to make choices and decisions uh, around these different topics. And so if we've identified living budgets, um, right, if, the, if I'm a junior generation and maybe we're taking less, is there a, you know, is there a conversation around sweat equity and things that we put in and we're willing to do that because we have some certainty about what we're working towards. Um, and then are mom and dad secure and is that number feasible for them? And uh, what happens, um, uh, right, what happens in a, in a case where we need to make sure it's in place? And so 
Farm financial health checkup is really gonna enable us to start talking with real numbers, putting it on the table, sharing what's feasible, and making sure all generations recognize that uh, we have to make some hard choices sometimes around, around what is uh, a good plan, or else we have lots of opportunity that we might wanna look at uh, for our business going forward. So some great articles and tools there as well to be sure you check through your cash flow analysis and then kind of understanding ratios as well that can add tremendous value to your plan. Uh, so you're all kind of talking the common language of uh, financially. And a big one with that is you're gonna be prepared to meet with your team and, and next step. So Vanessa, who would be on our team as we start to think through this? Yeah, certainly. And so um, what Joel and I are very cognizant of is, you know, this is a taking stock to begin the process at home um, within your own family and delegating. We'll get into that a little bit about roles and responsibilities there. But don't be afraid at the same time to reach out to your advisors. And so Joel will show you on the next slide here. Um, we listed out some common advisors that are there to truly support you through this journey. And if you don't know how to calculate your cash flow or you don't know how to interpret the ratios, that is absolutely fine. You are not alone. Reach out for that assistance that can support you so you can make those educated, proactive decisions. And so very common, what we hear in transition planning, of course, is our ownership advisors, our lawyers, our accountants, our financial planners. Um, but just as important, uh, Joel and I wanted to highlight, you know, who's on your business strategy team, um, what does that look like? How are we um, empowering junior generation with roles and responsibilities, decision making? And then something that I think um, we're getting better about talking about as an industry is the family circle. And let's be real, working with family has many blessings and opportunities, but it also has some heartache and some obstacles at time. And so who do you have on your family or individual advisory team to help walk you through um, the family journey. So it's something I'm very excited and encouraged to see us embracing um, our mental health journey within transition in agriculture. It's steps that we need to take because as Cynthia Beck shares, the greatest asset on the farm is you. So if we're transitioning this farm, we have to make sure you're empowered to take this on. And Joel, closing comments on advisors? Yeah, and, and it's always, I think, time and time again, we want to uh, Everybody wants that silver bullet that somebody just tells me an answer. And so I think all of these people involved, uh, you might not need all of them. You might need some of them at different times. They're going to have their perspective that they'll bring, but it is your plan to kind of coach and work through. And the best process is kind of getting that input from them early and then uh, so they can, uh, can kind of caution you on things or help you brainstorm some ideas and then move forward. And so really helps you to kind of dream big and think about what you could want. Uh, helps you stay accountable, right? Setting an appointment to, to meet with the account, with the lawyer to talk it through, uh, to meet with your uh, financial advisor, your lender to kind of stay on track too. And they can help add value and move those things forward. We don't always have to do it alone. So these eight steps uh, are, are uh, a great way to help you start. Remember, we're there, we're preparing and we're identifying what we might build in the transition plan as we go forward. And what it's really gonna enable you to do is to get organized, help yourself list out what information you're gonna need to collect. We don't have to do it all at once. We can kind of build this over time, but how are we gonna get organized if we have different uh, values or vision from our life partners, from our business partners? Uh, how do we get the same pieces of information out that everybody's gonna use? How is it gonna enable us to have better discussions with all those advisors and ESSA listed out that uh, we're talking a common language, we're working together, and everybody at the table kind of understands what we want to work through and by doing this checklist and working it through pulling those things up it's really going to give us those confidence that confidence to kind of take those next steps and move forward um, and really allow us to ask better questions of each other ideally getting back to what's important working in the business together moving forward with those things and you see i think time and time again we talked about that clarity and and certainty that uh right it's hard to kind of get moving but as we're making traction and we're working on this together it can be a lot of fun too to start to do these things uh, and the weight starts to come off when we are working towards something rather than uh, rather than kind of getting stuck on the middle. So those lots of different things that do come up. Um, and we just kind of want to revisit that. Again, that checklist is, is there for your use, but uh, some maybe take home messages from you, Anessa. 
And so I think certainly um, our hope today was that you saw that taking these first steps of preparing at home uh, can then help you with your advisors moving forward to tackle some of these um, upcoming obstacles and opportunities that your family will be facing. And so something that's really big about that is accountability and how are we going to keep this train chugging along. And something I often hear is senior generation is frustrated that junior generation um, isn't showing enough umph, isn't showing enough interest. Meanwhile, junior generation is saying to me, I'm just trying to be really cognizant not to step on mom and dad's toes. Or the opposite, um, because mom and dad aren't showing um, themselves that leadership, we're being seen as aggressive because we do need to have clarity and understanding for our future. So with this checklist, we really hope you understand the importance of preparing and setting um, who is going to complete each task. So as you'll see here, there's eight tasks to work through on our checklist. So is senior, senior generation responsible to do their cash flow statement by X date and junior generation is as well? Um, or what does that plan look like for you? We've shared a soft goal of completing one a month. Um, but again, obviously, if we don't put in the work, right, it's just like planting our seeds, um, we won't see the harvest. And so that's something, um, Joel, I'll let you speak on. We really see the families that feel in control and what families uh, do those look like? Yeah, and absolutely. I think this is something that, uh, right, you're taking ownership of the plan, building out those steps to keep moving forward. I think you, you said it, uh, uh, right, we're understanding those shared perspectives of each generation. So I think you said that brilliantly. And then also uh, checking the checklist to kind of uh, use that as a guide. And remember, today we kind of want to highlight those issues and work through what you're going to do to prepare. And the rest of the series is set up to kind of follow along and help you stay on topic uh, as a family to keep revisiting and having conversations after this. So with that, uh, stay tuned for those next steps. Again, our next session is in August 9th with Corey and Andrea. And uh, I think Roland's going to hit us with some, some hard questions here too. So. Some hard-hitting questions. So thanks, Anessa and Joel. If everyone give a virtual clap. I can't hear anything in here. I think that was outstanding. So some very interesting things to consider as we prepare, prepare to create farm transition plans that work for everybody. And you can tell there's a lot of things that need to be thought about. So um, we do have time, made time today for a few questions. I have a few that have been entered into the chat. Um, first one up, very interesting question, very common question. Can a farm be transitioned into a foundation? Yeah, that's a good question. So uh, absolutely it can be. Um, so you do see this lots. I think you see families that right have philanthropic goals or charitable goals and maybe we're not certain, right? There's things that uh, uh, absolutely you see lots of conservation easements, uh, education, the environment are huge topics of importance to farmers. So you do see them go into a foundation as gifts. Um, Rare occasions I've seen the foundation manage the farm, but sometimes they manage uh, more some of the assets that uh, are important for that farm to, to do. So absolutely can happen if we're talking about a, more of a charitable foundation. There's, there's ways to do joint ownership as well of family farms, but uh, foundations, right? Uh, I think best practices, I think some things that we've seen is, um, uh, right, I can think of a couple families I've met with that the family gets together and one of their shared goals is that philanthropic Piece. And so they meet regularly as a as a board to talk about their philanthropic goals and they want to see that continue. And so, yeah, like I said, I think both of them were one was uh, education based um, and one uh, and lots are kind of done on conservation easements as well for uh, for farms to look at. So definitely can be an option for families that uh, want to meet those goals or if it's more of a foundation on how we'd work together, there's ways to do that, too. Um, Perfect. Perfect. Great question. Yes. OK, second question. Uh, I, I think this is a common question. Uh, what should someone do after this event? What are the any first steps? What do you think the most important first step might be? Sure. So certainly, um, you know, again, we recognize um, that it's busy on the farm, no matter what enterprise you are in uh, or where you're at nationally. Um, but really, you know, hopefully you're coming off of a committed, I have a checklist. I actually have steps that I can start to implement. Um, and, you know, again, this will impact what age and stage you're at. But still, I would encourage you to go back and review um, uh, wherever you're at. Is there any elements we missed? Do we have to update our family tree? Things like that, for example. So I really hope 
first step is we get the family together and um, talk about what we heard, like we saw. Um, there wasn't too many people all sitting around the screen together, totally understandable. So talk about what we heard today and then start to assign um, roles and responsibilities and timelines of when we're gonna get these actions completed. Excellent, okay, next question. When should spouses be brought into the planning process? Yeah, Joel. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, that's a tough question. So um, ultimately, right, I, th I think it's something that the family gets to decide. So I know that's a cop-out answer, right? But it's something that uh, typically a meeting with, right, the, the nuclear family, um, and that can mean a lot of things. So I think what you want to do in these plans is ensure that you've got fair process. So. 100% I'm advocating that we've asked their opinion and I see families all over the map on this. I see families that you better make sure those people are involved because if they're not, there's gonna be some hard feelings. And I see some families that say, you know, we don't wanna be involved as a spouse uh, and, that, and that flows across all the spouses. We want you as a family to start to figure this out. Um, I would say a best practice more than anything is checking with them, making sure they understand what the process is, what it isn't. Um, and that you've got that same process, that you're not in a place where one spouse gets to participate and another one doesn't, because uh, those things can kind of cause some issues. But we as a family get to choose how we want to do that is, is my best cop-out answer a little bit. Um, but we recognize that they're having the opportunity to be heard and, what the, and address what their concerns are too become hugely important that uh, uh, everybody, I think, in any family business, in any family farm especially, is contributing to that operation, whether they're involved daily or not. So it's something that they're going to have a vested interest and I think best practice to check with them, uh, ensure they feel heard and that they've been part of that process in some capacity, but uh, uh, there's lots of conversations. Uh, sometimes we need to make sure we've addressed that as a family first. I don't know that uh, work. What are you thinking is? Yeah, for sure. I mean, I think you you hit all the highlights and if you're at the, the age and stage where, um, you know, we're starting this process, we're not 20 years into it, then again, it really goes back to that comment of being, proactive rather than reactive makes it not feel personal. And I think the example you gave at the uh, beginning, Joel, we see so often, um, there's an age gap between siblings. We let the first wife sit in at the meeting. Now, six years later, um, you know, we might not feel as comfortable with the second spouse. So she's not invited and it's an instant uh, blow up, for example. So kind of setting those expectations in place and something I think beyond that, um, is being very clear what that communication will be shared back to them like Joel alluded to. And that's my challenge um, to the farming spouse. If your spouse is not actively involved, um, but you as a farmer are, make sure you're communicating or sharing with them because often in our meetings, the spouse, um, you know, explains some grievances or some hurt feelings and it's like no one explained to him or her um, what was happening. So make sure you're communicating within your own marriage as well. We understand you're sometimes stuck in the middle between your parents and your spouse, um, but that communication, really important. Uh, you know, encourage families. This is where we have some fun with it. Um, can you take the corporate credit card and go out for supper, you know, once a year, things like that. Talk about the farm, talk about your goals and aspirations, even if you're not actively involved and start to celebrate our journey together. Excellent. Not, not a cop-out answer. That was, that was very <laughs> yeah. good. So uh, we got time for one last question. Um, it's a great question. Um, how long does a transition plan take to make? Yeah, so uh, the, again, you're going you're gonna to force me back to an it depends answer, right? So these things take time. We talked about different ages that we're at, right? We always, I think, best practice, and S and I discuss all the time, that if you start early, you get more options in these plans. If we're starting later and we're, you know, we're fairly advanced and working in the farm, we're going to have to make decisions probably a little quicker uh, to make sure things are getting in place, um, or we're going to be addressing some of those issues in, in, in a little bit harder way. So I think setting good timelines, recognizing they're not always fixed. They're things that need to adapt. We need, might need time, or we might need to make sure what happens if we have to speed things up are in place, um, right? I, I don't know, a best one used to say, you know, we're always in transition and so it's a process we're continuing to work through, but I think certain ages and stages that, you know, you're, we're talking about how you enter the business at a start and if we're young, it's gonna look different. Maybe we need to work on the farm for a few years. So you get to define it, but I do like us to think through timelines. So I always use a five-year goal that it's so 
tough to see past five years. What is it going to look like? What's going to change? The whole farm might not have transitioned, but what does it look like for us as a family? And then we start to pencil with those five-year benchmarks that maybe, right, they're just coming back to the farm and we're 18 and back on the farm and five years is going to look vastly different from someone that's 40 years of and they've got 20 years of working on the farm and now we need a five-year timeline that's probably going to be uh, accelerated much more. So looks vastly different. Uh, again, a cop-out answer. Maybe Anessa will give us the real one here. <laughs> no, for sure. But I think that's, um, you know, the, the other side of that is getting our own internal stakeholders organized, um, but also leaning on our technical advisors as well and having some of those upfront conversations about what does timelines look like for you in your office and how soon can we expect a turnaround? Um, you know, not going to your accountant in the middle of tax season and saying, hey, can we talk about a share redemption schedule? Um, being cognizant of building that team environment. And I think that's something, um, you know, when we talk about working with our advisors, we see in your question, Roland, of how long um, it's not one and done, right? And so, for example, uh, we'll see people that have brought junior generation into the business, the share structure is set a certain way, and then they haven't discussed or assessed it for another 10, 15 years. And so now junior generation is at that um, kind of butting heads conversation when really if the family had built that five-year process to go back and work with their advisors and say what does this structure look like on a smaller scale every five years just for example only um, it really shows that it doesn't feel so stressful when we're working with our advisors um, more as a team environment and, and can i do you mind if i add one to that too as a rebuttal that uh, i think as a first step what we're hoping for it, it, with this too is that you're going to revisit each of these uh, monthly sessions till March 2023. And so it's going to be something that's going to help us prepare. And that's going to be one of your key questions in that is what is a realistic timeline look like? Um, right. Again, I encourage families to think about that as a goal that you're step by step. Uh, and we're starting to talk about what's going to change five years from now. What's uh, what's going to be different and what conversations do we need to have to get ready? So I think our hope with this series is that you're going to follow each of these uh, uh, debrief with a family and then that's going to help you build your own timeline as part of that, too. So. See the website and, the, and kind of the event list there in the chat and uh, uh, keep building that process. Yep, excellent, perfect. I mean, great, great answers. I mean, excellent questions by those out there. And I think one thing, I don't think there is a cop-out answer. I think uh, farms, you know, farms are always different. Every situation's different. Right. And uh, that's why working with these guys personally, I know just the knowledge they can share and help your operation, this series is really gonna be crucial. It's uh, asking the questions. There's never a bad question because every situation's different, so. Communication is the best part. Okay, so that does it for us here today, our time together. So again, thanks, Anessa and Joel. Um, you're going to receive a link to a recording in a few days. Please take the time, rewatch, rewatch with your family and share so everyone can look at their roles in the farm and into retirement. You'll also receive an email shortly in your inbox with the links, uh, the event evaluation form. Um, if you're not filled it out, if you're not filled out the form to register for the rest of the event series, it will also be included. So we encourage you to attend the entire series as our business advisors and other experts walk you down the path to farm transition step by step. And do not need to worry if you miss a session or two, they will all be recorded and sent to you. And then they will also be available on our YouTube channel. Remember, everyone who attends the entire series will also receive a certificate at the end in recognition of your journey down the path with us. So on behalf of FCC, Anessa and Joel, thank you for joining us today.